again, um, we would like to ask you, if you uh, have not muted, to please do so. <clears throat> um, we uh, are pleased to have you join us today, and the title of today's presentation is Estuarine Acidification, a Conceptual Discussion with Examples. This series is hosted by Southeast Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network. In short, the series lays a foundation for the state of ocean acidification science in the Southeast region. These webinars are intended to create a dialogue among scientists to identify what is known, what isn't known, and what research in other regions of the United States can be applied to better understand ocean acidification and its impacts in the southeastern U.S. region. With awareness of and access to the research and its applications and uses, webinar participants will be able to collaborate to better understand and adapt to ocean acidification moving forward. As I mentioned, I'm Paula Keener. I'm Director of Education for NOAA's Ocean um, Acidification and Research Program and its Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and a member of the SOCAN Steering Committee, and I'll be facilitating today's session. We also have Jen Bennett Mintz, and she's Education and Outreach Coordinator for NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program online, and Jen will be helping to answer questions from the attendees. During the presentation, uh, you as attendees will be in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type questions related to technical issues or questions for the presenter into the questions box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll be monitoring incoming questions during the presentation, and we will respond to them or post them to our speaker after the presentation. We are also recording this session, and the video recording and the PDF of the presentation will be available on the SOCAN website. We are pleased to welcome Wei Jun Kai today for the presentation. Uh, Wei Jun is a professor at the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy in Newark, Delaware. Wei Jun received his PhD in oceanography from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And uh, Wei Jun um, has worked on marine carbon cycling for 20 years. His research areas include calcium carbonate dissolution and sediment diagenics in the deep sea using microelectrodes, air-sea exchange of carbon dioxide, and carbon cycling in coastal oceans. Most recently, Wei Jun's research has focused on the responses of coastal ocean carbon cycles and ecosystems to a changing terrestrial export of carbon and nutrients, as well as bottom water acidification in estuaries, estuaries and coastal oceans. Wei Jun has over 101 peer-reviewed scientific publications. He's received over 31 research grants. He advises numerous graduate students and postdocs, and he has also received numerous honors and awards. Wei Jun, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you at this time. Welcome. Uh, introduction. Good afternoon. Can you show me my screen? Hello. Can you hear me? I guess so. Yeah, and uh, thank you to Paula for the nice introduction. While Paula was talking, I uh, noticed I should have put a, a background on this first slide uh, from, say, Sapporo Island. But uh, for now, let's pretend this is right outside the Otamaha River. You have the room and the estuary. Um, so I, I just want to mention, before I moved to University of Delaware, I was a faculty for 18 years in the University of Georgia. And so that's where I started to stu study the uh, carbonate, the CO2 system in the southeast. So this was a really happy opportunity, and I'm grateful to this, uh, to talk about uh, uh, ocean acidification in Ashton and uh, uh, coastal waters, <clears throat> and, and so I have some result from the southeast. I can talk about that, but uh, mostly I want to bring uh, a view from you know different estuaries to see what kind of different acidification we may expect. Uh, I understand that uh, last week uh, our first talk, Rick, Rick Weininkoff, did a first talk. I promised to. Uh, go over his webinar over the weekend. I 
haven't really finished, but I saw the first view. And so he said he will provide a far side view, and I guess under that context, I'll do a more near side, I guess. Uh, well, no, I, I will have both, I guess. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll do a, a brief introduction, and then I'll start with examples of a certification in low oxygen events in coastal ocean. I was reminded that the audience, uh, you know, most have science background, although not everyone is doing the OA study right now, so I should have started with something um, um, easy to understand and have, I, I don't know if I can accomplish that, I'll try. So I'll start with real example, and then I'll go to into something more theoretical, try to discuss from first the principles, why we would see this and that, what do we expect uh, you know, changes in the ocean acidification or how really how system different etching will respond to ocean acidification and other biogeochemical process. And I'll have a summary. If I we have a few minutes left, I just want to show a few slides of my recent work in the you know a little bit north of the SAB, so in the Delaware and Chesapeake Bay. Uh, all right, so what is really ocean acidification in coastal waters? There seems not a lot of debate about what is ocean acidification in open ocean, but in coastal ocean it's getting more complicated, I guess, or less defined. Well, first, uh, you know, I want to satisfy, satisfy open ocean people to say that ocean acidification can still define as what they define, global ocean uptake of atmospheric CO2 uh, as a re result of this anthropogenic CO2 increase in the ocean, so that's already lead to uh, delta pH decrease. Uh, I think you are seeing two this uh, screen. Let me just use duplicate the slideshow this way. Okay, uh, so we here I, I would take this more narrow de definition of uh, ocean acidification first as a response to anthropogenic CO2 increase in the ocean uh, in, in the atmosphere. Let me see if we could use this uh, laser point. That was good. So anyway, we have this source water being acidified with a higher DIC to alkalinity ratio. Basically, when you uptake CO2, you have higher DIC, but that doesn't change the alkalinity. So this source water, open ocean water, has this higher ratio than pre-industry, and that water would add back to onshore and mix with low salinity waters. Now, we could also have local anthropogenic CO2 uptake in the estuary zone or coastal water as well, but uh, uh, most of it's probably from, you know, definitely from open ocean. And this water is further acidified by respiration, that is decomposition of organic matter falling from protective surface water, in this case, or actually it could be from terrestrial or productive salt marsh. So we already know there is this acidification of source water from anthropogenic CO2 and this respiration that is the decomposition of organic matter from productive surface water like in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Mississippi River Plume case or in maybe outside near Sapporo Island, uh, Otamaha River, we could have salt marsh organic matter coming out and get decomposed to produce a lot of CO2 and there are also other uh, microbial process could uh, generate acid. The real question or less known question is how do they interact? Okay, And I want to emphasize that this interaction you know, is changing with time as anthropogenic CO2 increase, actually this overlap part will increase. So let me start with a few examples around the North America continent from 
uh, west coast to first go north to the Barents Sea and come back to the east coast as a, at starting with the Estrin and the Gulf of St. Lawrence and down to the Mid-Atlantic Bight and uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, I wouldn't forget South Atlantic Bight. I want to apologize. This America centralized the view. If there's anyone from Europe or Asia uh, listening to this talk, but, uh, all right. Uh, so this is in the west coast. The dominant process, as you read from Dick Feely's paper, uh, 208 paper in Science, is really by this upwelling that brings low pH and low oxygen and low aragonized saturation water on shore and expose uh, ecosystem there on the low pH. So this upwelling water could uh, further actually gets into estuary, like uh, here into the uh, one Fuka and uh, this estuary uh, near Seattle. And you see very low oxygen and a very low pH and low aragonite saturation that is mostly due to this upwelling and superimposed on that this upwelling signal is a local respiration. And, and that this a little you know, kind of stagnation of the water so allow this uh, low pH to be developed further. And if we move north to the Barren Sea in the summer case, this is a paper by Jeremy Nassius, and you can see that the low aragonite saturation state is largely driven by this very high production in the surface when the organic matter settles in the bottom and decompose, generate CO2 and peak low pH and lead to low pH and low saturation state. And that is also uh, have impact in you know, this seasonal uh, ice melt, and that's also dramatizes this uh, low pH events by largely to promote this biological production in the surface. So if we come to the east coast, uh, this first example I show is from St. Lawrence Estuary Gulf, and again for the same reason, you know. This water stratification lead to low oxygen and low pH events in the subsurface and low aragonite saturation state. And what's most interesting from their example is they have some data not only back to 1980s but also to 1935 before pH uh, the MBS scale was even established. If assuming you know we we know the pH relatively well then. So you see this pH decrease with time uh, a, a long record. All right, uh, let's move to the South Atlantic divide for, for first. And I would only mention uh, there are a few past publications for my own group. So this is a my former student, the Li Qing Zhang's publication shows this uh, uh, saturation state in the U.S. east coast, in the, mainly in the South Atlantic Bight, and in comparison with the west coast. And uh, this is a, paper, a more recent paper by uh, Eric Wang. Uh, he actually published this. This paper is about us. This called Go Mac Wang Cruise. That uh, research led by the Kwanikov, which surveys the entire east coast and uh, Gulf of Mexico and east coast uh, to show this uh, uh, pH and carbonate saturation state. And earlier, my own research on the uh, inside of the estuaries mostly, that, that was uh, kind of a little before the acidification time, and I actually was one of the first, I guess, point out in the southeast, uh, you know, these river and estuary with rich in organic matter, humic, humic substance, that organic matter can contribute to alkalinity and to the pH and even uh, control the pH uh, in these estuaries. And we'll show that result very soon. 
So here are some recent uh, survey. We haven't. Uh, we had six cruises in uh, 2014. Uh, we haven't really done a good uh, data analysis yet. I just show some preliminary result here, and you can see, as we know before, in offshore um, pH are generally high, but uh, in the near shore part, in the estuarine, inside estuarine, you see very low pH to as low as you know. Here we actually show only like 7.5, but uh, in specific measurement, some area it could be very low, like inside here. And uh, almost every season you have you see low pH in estuarine. And I just added this slide 10 minutes before my talk. This is from my 1998 GCA paper, and in that paper we show very low pH in the Satira River estuarine and Otamaha River, so you can have pH as low as 5.5 to 7. You know, these very low pH, and as I showed in that paper, was really dominated by export of you know, the humic substance from swamps and uh, from uh, salt marsh. And there, the, mechanistically, you have this alkalinity. Uh, surprisingly, 50% of alkalinity is really organic alkalinity, and that organic alkalinity maximizes you know, in the estuarine, low salinity zone, and as salinity increases, and the system gradually shifts from uh, Humic substance control the pH to carbonate system to the uh, offshore water. And uh, I, when I published that paper, of course, we don't know anything. About, we didn't really talk about ocean acidification. And uh, uh, so for 10 years, nobody really cited my paper and until uh, a more recent time. And I'm happy to see citation of this work, and I also want to mention I'm very happy to see my former student, Eric Wang, a scientist in Woodhull now, a lot of excellent study in this, this area. Okay, uh, let's move to this uh, so-called uh, uh, this uh, 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 ocean acidification modeling at the Grace Reef. That's actually right here somewhere, yeah, at uh, this 18, 20 meter depth. So that's uh, uh, supported by NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, and this morning is uh, one of the two longer ones in the east coast. Uh, we have now uh, eight years of data, so this one in the Grace Reef and another one in the uh, in right offshore University of New Hampshire by Joe Sosbury. And this is uh, atmospheric CO2, this water CO2, of course, you see this very strong seasonal control in the southeast uh, uh, following this uh, in, uh, SST, the temperature change. But uh, interestingly is when we deseasonalize this data, there is a trend of rapid CO2 increase. Actually, this is very surprisingly high, about 10 micro atmosphere per year. And if you know that uh, uh, the anthropogenic CO2 increase in the atmosphere is only about 2 ppm, uh, so it should lead to about 2 micro atmosphere uh, increase per year. But we see from the current analysis of this data, we got a 4 to 5 times higher CO2 increase, which means a much rapid pH decrease that you would expect to see from uh, just responding to atmospheric CO2. And the reason right now our analysis attributed that to the wet dry cycle of the river export in the southeast, it's, it's this, we were in this dry cycle in a, it, before 2007 and after 2008, we get this, a lot of signal coming out of the CO2 from river and salt marshes, and I think that's that's the reason. And we just submitted this paper, my uh, postdoc uh, Janet Weimers uh, submitted this paper, uh, paper to JGR Ocean, and, and uh, we are now following this study and see how this changes in the dry wet cycle from the terrestrial export would affect us. So to 
and pH signal, and likely it's possible you know we'll get much less changes uh, in the next when we analyze the next few years data. But uh, one thing tells us this uh, subdecadal changes. You know, a lot of reasons could make lead to that change. You can have much faster local response to uh, ocean acidification because of various other reasons. All right, uh, uh, let me now move to this, uh, my study in the Gulf of Mexico, and I just want to use that as an example of how uh, this anthropogenic CO2 leads acidification can interact with uh, eutrophication and respiration. So the Gulf of Mexico is a real good example because it's not just one system, you know, and globally you have lots of places we are have this double stressor, this uh, uh, anthropogenic CO2 and eutrophication. So, so this is a, a study we, uh, my group did uh, a survey in May and August 2007 that you can see when stratification starts in May and uh, it, when it comes to August you have widespread low oxygen uh, hypoxia events develop and accompany that you have low pH and very low uh, and very high DIC and uh, one reason we are sure that this very high DIC is related to very high production in the surface and the organic carbon decomposition lead to this is when you look at alkalinity uh, there's no alkalinity increase so so it's not like a vaccine or elk. there's no alkalinity change. Actually, it's a little bit lower uh, because accumulation of fresh water. So it's not like the West uh, Coast case. You have changing in uh, ocean upwelling or mixing in that case. So you can see aragonite saturation reduced greatly compared with you know May, but it's still. Uh, relatively high. That is because the Gulf of Mexico system is actually a best buffered system uh, with very high temperature and salinity, very high alkalinity. But uh, uh, we will see later when you superimpose this with uh, continuous atmospheric CO2 increase when it comes to the end of 21st century, actually this entire area, if we still have the same uh, eutrophication and hypoxia, this entire area will be undersaturated to aragonite, so that will be have very uh, serious consequence. So here I want to show you this correlation of pH to the oxygen consumption. So when oxygen decreases, you actually have this decrease in pH and not only in the Mississippi and in the Changjiang, the Yangtze River plume area. Uh, so it's the same thing and actually it follows theoretical prediction very well when you have uh, oxygen consumption you will produce CO2 and the model will predict that pH change and the data actually agrees with that in general. And uh, now if you only look at this picture you probably will ask where is the anthropogenic CO2? So that we will have to actually use a little bit of model tool to do that. If we start with today's atmospheric CO2 and if we back to pre-industry or we increase PCO2 in the atmosphere to the future, and then we could add this respiration derived CO2 and drive the pH down. And that's what we showed in the previous slides. Now, what I want to emphasize is this is what we define as ocean acidification in open ocean or in open Gulf Mexico what here is we would see a 0.11 pH unit decrease by increase atmospheric CO2 from 288 to 385 okay, ppm and uh, but if we do this in this up hypoxia zone where oxygen is really low or zero here and where CO2 is already high okay, and you could have because of respiration so you could have a much greater pH change due to this 
introducing this CO2 from atmosphere. Uh, CO2 increase in atmosphere would give us an OA effect of 0.16 instead of 0.11. So that's uh, quite a bit of increase. Actually, this will make this ocean acidification what we predict for the open ocean in the surface water you know, uh, to the end of this century, which already occurring here in the bottom water of Mexico. And we can predict that for the future, you will have a much larger ocean acidification signal than you know, the uh, oxic low CO2 water. And so that's what I call it enhanced ocean acidification uh, because of this CO2 introduced uh, from respiration. And you can call that the other way, this uh, you know, ocean uh, anthropogenic CO2 amp amplify the biological signal. It, it's the same thing uh, when you uh, discuss that theoretically. The reason for behind that was this weakened buffer capacity uh, in CO2. So if we start, I have this here is delta pH relative to a certain delta DIC change. So here is I multiply 100. So uh, for every 100 micromole of DIC or CO2 addition to the system, how much is the pH change? So in the pre-industrial time, when all in today, you know, today's uh, oxic water with low, relatively low CO2, that change is relatively small as we predict like 0.1 pH unit or a little bit higher than that. And when we come to this anoxic water, and that with the same anthropogenic CO2, and you will have a lot stronger response, okay? So for per 100 micromole of the CO2 addition, we will have a lot more pH change. And the reason behind that is really the system has a lot weaker buffer capacity when you add the CO2 to that. And this is going to continue. This is another curve called the Revell factor. That's the oceanography like to use. But I just directly calculate delta pH against the IC. So this will continue. The signal will continue to amplify until a day when the water DIC, total dissolving organic carbon, surpass to equal or you know, beyond this alkalinity value, and, and that will be uh, quite a while later after the end of the century, and the signal actually will decrease in this, uh, this uh, amplification will decrease, but uh, the acidification is still there, of course. Uh, so overall, it's, it's because of weakening of buffer capacity, and I will discuss in more detail uh, in the next part. We we'll try to discuss how would we expect to see where you you know under what salinity and temperature condition uh, you will see the largest amplification, that is the largest interaction between anthropogenic CO2 and metabolic CO2. That's the focus on my next uh, part of talk. Um, I think we're uh, a little short of time. I should try to uh, go fast here. So I, I started with just an ocean water and river water mixing. Okay, just assume this uh, river water has a low alkalinity and, uh, and ocean water with high alkalinity and then this uh, aerobic respiration. But uh, in real case, it would be more complicated. Uh, so in this work, uh, Bill Sander and, and myself actually examined this case is when you we present this as uh, the difference of the effect of this respiration caused the change. Okay, uh, this is present as a log unit of CO2 change and carbonated cha change in saturation state, and this is the pH. So as you can see, in the lower salinity, so salinity 4 to 36, and the lower salinity and lower temperature, the blue color is 1 degree C, uh, and, uh, yeah, 
and you see the pH change and the pH, uh, I'm sorry, the CO2 change and the pH change, they are greatest. Uh, there is a large change in both pH, uh, pH and pCO2 when the salinity and temperature is low. At a higher salinity and temperature, there are less change in relative CO2 and uh, in the decrease of pH. So the estuarine water is very vulnerable to ocean acidification and to the interaction of respiration with ocean acidification. And uh, uh, carbonate, this main reason was really a decrease of the initial carbonate concentration. I'm going to skip uh, some slides because we're running out of time, but I, I just want to point out what is really the big difference between low and high salinity, really it's uh, part of the uh, main reason is because it's carbonate, initial carbonate concentration is much lower, okay? And that is because of K1, K2 of uh, changes with temperature and salinity, the K2 mainly. Uh, so that is a solubility, I mean, the dissociation constant of the carbonic uh, acid, the K2, as a function of salinity and temperature, and, and that leads to a much weaker uh, buffer capacity and a lower carbonate concentration in the low salinity and low temperature water. And next slides uh, uh, really just try to say that these two systems, one at a low temperature and one at a high temperature, and uh, with this and uh, how this will respond to the future, uh, you know, atmospheric CO2 increase, and it shows a system like a Gulf Mexico, it will continue to provide a high buffer capacity to neutralize the increased CO2 in the atmosphere, and a system in like a, a low pH or low temperature, like the Arctic and. and uh, ocean and uh, like winter time in the Chesapeake Bay at a very low pH. It has a very weak buffer capacity and that system almost uses up its buffer capacity. So it will change it uh, with, you know, in a different way from Gulf Mexico. But uh, still today you know, the system in this weak buffer capacity system has a stronger response have a greater delta pH change due to the respiration. All right, I think I'm running out of time and I'm going to just point out the, the, this key point and that's all related to the initial carbonate concentration in the water. I'm going to skip this. Just uh, this will just try to show that uh, at this point that uh, carbon is equal to CO2 concentration, the system is most sensitive to uh, adding additional pH, so it has the largest pH, pH change. Uh, I want to show one more slide that is a modification of this model. When we talk about estrogen in the, in the discussion I just gave, is we assume at every salinity temperature the water is fully uh, in contact with the atmosphere before we start this respiration. But in reality, that may not be the case. In an estuarine, we could have a system that uh, either because of very high PCO2 in estuarine water or this low PCO2 like uh, in Chesapeake Bay and high is like in Georgia River, there is no chance for CO2 directly invaded into the water. But uh, even at a low PCO2, if the water residence time is so low, you may not have enough time to uptake uh, anthropogenic CO2. So in this case, the ocean acidification signal, the acid, uh, anthropogenic CO2, is purely via the mixing of this already acidified source water, that's the seawater, mixing into the ocean. In that case, you will have um, zone in the estuarine that you will have a, a maximum pH decrease, okay? So in the highest salinity area, we have this 
strong ocean acidification signal, but uh, the water is well buffered. When you go in to mix with seal, river water buffer capacity decreases, so the signal delta pH change increases. But to a certain point, there is a value, this maximum uh, uh, response actually start to decrease. That's because we have less and less anthropogenic CO2 from the ocean gets mixed into uh, the estuary. So there is this zone uh, weak the buffer capacity. We can call that there is a maximum acidification zone uh, exists. And this idea was advanced by Dr. Xinping, who currently an assistant professor at Texas and and M University Corpus Christi and was presented in this paper. And uh, the challenge, real challenge is really how do we, you know, prove that there exists this estrogen uh, uh, maximum, uh, uh, maximum acidification zone. So uh, uh, that's an interesting topic we could uh, follow. So I want to just quickly summarize. Uh, uh, respiration often plays a major important role in uh, acidifying coastal groundwater today. However, anthropogenic CO2 uptake from the atmosphere will play an increasingly important role uh, in acidifying coastal groundwater. I often hear people say, if respiration is dominating today, why you even you know, study ocean acidification in the estuary? Uh, I, I disagree with that, as you can see from my talk. First is they have this interaction that will actually intensify the acidification. Secondly, is because you have, you know, the anthropogenic signal is going to keep increasing. So uh, later this century, that actually they go into surpass this uh, respiration, and that interaction actually keep growing. And there is a strong enhancement of acidification in CO2 enriched water, and particularly at the low salinity and temperature in the inside estuary in the low salinity water. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap up here. And as I understand, this uh, talk will be uploaded, uh, and, and you can see some other slides on my recent work. And uh, I'm not going to present that anymore. Okay, thank you. Wei Xin, uh -huh. thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, that was a, an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, what I would uh, like to, to do at this point is um, open it up to questions. And we do have one question in already. And this is regarding uh, your slide that showed the mooring time series plot off of Georgia. And um, the, the one that uh, demonstrated the strong freshwater runoff in 2006. And uh, it, it was noted that there's no corresponding changes in uh, salinity or pH. And the question is, uh, why? Actually, the large uh, the increase in river discharge after 2008. Uh, so 2006 was still a dry year. And if we will go back to, I don't, since you can't, can't see my screen anymore, right? Actually, there is a salinity. The salinity, uh, there is no secular trend in salinity if you look all the salinity signal. But if you only look at the summer signal, uh, actually there is a salinity decrease due to the increase the freshwater output. And I didn't mention our P rapid PCO2 increase was really summertime only. When you look at wintertime, signal there's no PCO2 increase. So mm -hmm. that, that's another reason it's related to this uh, uh, freshwater export and maybe also related to how close Gulf Stream is from you know, the shore. Because winter time, yeah, uh, I think um, that's, uh, that, that's my answer. We are still continue to follow that, follow up with that uh, issue, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, if you have them, you can type them into the chat, into the question box. Okay. I'm not seeing any any more questions at this point. All right. Well, I would like to thank anybody. 
<coughs> or excuse me, thank everybody for <laughs> attending um, the SOCAN State of the Science webinar today. Um, if you, um, if we welcome any feedback on this, or and if you have any further questions or suggestions for topics on this women, webinar series, you can uh, enter that information on the first um, uh, web link that you see on the screen. And you can submit input by replying to the follow-up emails, and you'll receive uh, emails from us um, listed on this slide there, Abby. And um, the recording of this webinar and a PDF of the presentation will be available on the SOCAN website with the URL listed also on this um, on the slide. So our next um, webinar will be uh, Understanding Larval Bivalve Responses to Ocean Acidification, and that will be given by George Waldbusser from Oregon State University on Tuesday, April the 7th at 12 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. And we, um, we hope that you can join us for that. And um, again, if you have any additional questions that come up for Wei Jun, uh, please send them to us, and we will make sure that he gets them and he can respond via email. Wei Jun, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation today, and thank you all for enjoy for joining us on our second SOCAN webinar. Bye bye. Thank you, Paula. Thank you.